Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is Matty Hoban from Quantinium, which is also called Cambridge Quantum or Cambridge Quantum Computing, as far as I could see. So let me say a few words about uh, Matty. So Matty did his PhD at the uh, University College London with Dan Brown around 2011 or 2012, something like this. No? And the, his PhD was about relation between non-locality and measurement-based quantum computation. Then he did a few stays abroad and in the UK. So the first one was in Atikfo, uh, in Tony's uh, Asin's group. Then he uh, moved to the University of Oxford, where he was in the groups of Jonathan Barrett and uh, Ian Walmsley. And now he's a senior research scientist at Cambridge Quantum. And Cambridge Quantum, as far as I understand, or Quantinium, is a private company, no? That yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's currently software. private, yeah. Fully private? I believe so, yeah, unless they okay. told me something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So unless, unless I've missed an email. Okay, so today he will tell us about how to use uh, quantum networks to self-test all, uh, I don't know, pure and tangled states. And maybe before that, he could say a few words about uh, this uh, Quantinium company. Would oh. that be possible? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, okay. thanks, Ramik, for the really nice introduction. Did I give you this information? Like, the, the biography, I was quite impressed. It's like, uh, I tried to keep myself very secret. Did you, uh, did I give you that information? Well, I found your website. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> you, so I was you were just trying to read. Me. Thanks very much. It was nice. Um, <laughs> this is quite a challenge. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, yes. So uh, I'm uh, Matty Hoban. Hello. Um, so I joined Cambridge Quantum Computing, which is a private company um, doing quantum computing research based originally out of Cambridge and then expanded to offices in Japan, London, and now Oxford, which is where I currently am, I'm in Oxford. Um, and then um, a few months ago, it formally um, was acquired by this company called Quantinuum, which was a spin-out company from Honeywell Quantum Solutions. So you might know about Honeywell Quantum Solutions. They are doing iron trap um, based quantum computing. Um, and so they have quite some impressive uh, hardware. And so um, essentially the, the two companies merged uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing with Quantinium. So now we're, we're all over the globe. And uh, next week I'm visiting colleagues in, in Colorado. So it's, uh, yeah, it's quite exciting. Um, so more specifically, I am in the um, quantum cryptography group at CQ at Quantinium, which will soon just be at Quantinium. Um, so the head of the group is Florian Kuscho, who I know Remick knows at least, um, and uh, so he has background um, in device independence, uh, random number generation and things like this, and uh, Remick and I have worked with him. But we have uh, other people, and another ICFO connection is Mafalda Almeida, who's also a senior research scientist. Stefano Peronio, again, completes the ICFO connection who's a scientific advisor, and we have uh, Sherilyn Wright, who's a research scientist, Cameron, who's also doing a PhD at UCL, Ella, who um, has a background in classical cryptography, uh, Richie, who is still with us, but I think is leaving and, and does some of the software implementations that we're interested in, and Hayley, who's going to be uh, joining us full-time, who is just recently a PhD student at Imperial. So yeah, there's, there's quite a few of us, so I thought I'd include this slide so that First, you're aware that there is quantum cryptography being done at Continuum, and also uh, maybe there are some people you're familiar with there. Okay, so what we're interested in, in the quantum crypto group is, currently a lot of it is in quantum random number generation, especially taking a device independent, a semi-device independent approach. Uh, we're getting more interested in quantum key distribution, um, and more generally, we're, we're interested in device independent quantum information, verification, certification, um, and also a bit of research in something called post-quantum cryptography, which is the classical cryptography that's secure against quantum computing attacks and quantum networks and other things. So yeah, we're, we're currently expanding and uh, we're always happy to have new academic partnerships and if people are interested, please get in touch. Okay, so 
I think um, I have a again, question concerning uh, this company. So you, your yeah. role is, I mean, you just do pure science or you have to do something yeah. else? Just I, I do, yeah, pure research. Yep. Okay. Um, that is what my job is, but I am involved in in some like product secret development products. and yeah, secret things. So yeah, I never know what I can say. So this is this is the one thing that's new from moving from academia to uh, industry is I'm quite a loud mouth. Um, so now I have to be careful of what I say. So that's okay. kind of a, an interesting transition for me. But yeah, yeah. But my, my talk position, is like it's not secret, no. I mean the no, this talk's not secret. Otherwise, I'm a complete and utter idiot. Yeah. So it was also it's on the archive, um, so yeah, yeah. it's not secret. <laughs> um, yes. So again, this feels like a tribute to uh, the Institute of Photonic Sciences and Castel de Fels. But uh, so this is based on some work that we did with Antonio Thien, Marc Olivier Renou, um, Joe Bowles, who's now at Xanadu. So the yeah, another emigre well, to industry. Uh, but is he still in Barcelona? Do you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, last time I spoke to Joe, he was physically in Barcelona, and that's that's the plan. Um, and Ivan Chupic, who uh, yeah, who's now in Paris. Okay, so yeah, it's it's always really nice to work with people who are far more intelligent than yourself. And this was a nice little project um, that gave me a chance to work with people far more intelligent than me. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so I'm going to give. Uh, an in overview, um, kind of high level overview, because I'm not sure what the background is of people, but I will just get stuck into it. Okay, so device independent setting. We have um, a system that's distributed amongst uh, two or more parties, and each party essentially has a black box, and they can um, choose inputs for this black box and get outputs, right? They can classically interact with these black boxes. But because they're black boxes, we don't really know um, the dimension of the Hilbert spaces. For example, if these are quantum states, we have no idea of the dimension of the Hilbert space. We don't know what's happening inside of these black boxes. It produces some classical data for us, but we don't know the process by which it produces this data. Um, so we don't exactly know the measurements nor do we know the joint quantum state. Everything is kind of a black box here. So given this, this you know, lack of information, it would be nice to have something like a reverse Born rule, right? Okay, the Born rule tells us if I'm given state and measurements, I'll be able to recover some statistics. So that's, let's think about it in the other direction of given some statistics from these black boxes. Um, and I'll assume that they don't uh, communicate um, there's just some common cause between these two black boxes. And given these uh, statistics, can we conclude the quantum state shared by both parties? So um, like many people in the study of quantum correlations, um, like, you know, we write these things, but I know st statisticians might get upset with this. And so when I write this, I really mean this. Okay, just, just to point that out. Don't want to upset any statisticians. Okay, so um, kind of another way, a quantum information way of, of, of stating this is, can we certify the quantum state? So is there a way of um, being given some data, some statistics? Can we accept whether this comes from a particular quantum state? Yes or no? So this is certifying the quantum state. So very informally, um, um, because the device independent setting is special, uh, quantum state certification or measurement certification is often called self-testing. Um, and this is for historical reasons. So we say that the correlations self-test a particular quantum state if we can conclude that this state, up to some symmetries that hopefully I'll make clearer later, this particular state is shared by the parties. Okay, so this, this is a nice, you know, esoteric question. Um, and a motivation for thinking about this is device independent quantum cryptography. Um, here, we try to circumvent a lot of the problems of implementing quantum cryptographic systems by treating devices as black boxes to kind of allow for general side channel attacks and things like this. And so we avoid characterization of the physics of the devices. We have minimal assumptions on their workings. 
so it's harder for an eavesdropper to exploit uh, the physical implementations. And hopefully this is, this is relevant for noisy near-term devices where we don't have uh, immaculate quantum control and um, there might be some noise. Okay. Um, so determining the quantum state of the device in this way using self-testing could be seen as a primitive for quantum key distribution, quantum randomness generation, and, and also the verification of a quantum computation, which was kind of the, the outset of this self-testing. Okay, and here's a, a brief summary of what's going on, what's happened in the field of self-testing over the last uh, 20 odd years. So it was first formally stated as an expression, self-testing by Myers and Yao in the early 2000s, where they showed the two qubit maximally uh, entangled states can be self-tested. Okay, there's, there's a protocol for looking at statistics and concluding that you're sharing uh, the maximum entangled states. Um, and then going back, okay, I'm jumping around a bit in time, but you can go back to the 80s. And of course, you know, everything non-trivial was done in the 70s and the 80s in, in Central Europe or the Soviet Union. So of course, in 1987, um, uh, Summers and, and Werner, showed that uh, the maximal violation of the clauser horn shimony halt the CHSH inequality, self-tests the two qubit maximally entangled states. And like, this result was, again, independently discovered, I think, in the early 90s. Um, OK. And then more recently, uh, Coladangelo et al. showed that- I think can I have a- Yeah. Excuse me, can I have a question concerning this paper by Summers and Werner? Yeah. So do they- uh, so in what sense do they self-test the, the maximum entangled state by uh, from the violation of, of the CHS? Yeah, okay. It's a good question. And so I'm I guess that they just prove that this, uh, the maximum entangled state of two qubits plus the known measurements, I don't know, maximally violate or something? Or this yeah, I, I think they use some quantum field theoretic arguments to conclude that the Hilbert space decomp decomposes a direct sum of Oh, um, okay. like four dimensional subspaces. So it's a bit like this Jordan's lemma, which um, comes uh -huh. up a bit later. So do they, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not quite phrased in the way that how we normally think of self-testing. No, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. no, I was curious about Is that. it mathematically equivalent, more or less? Mm -hmm. like, or very close yeah, to so I, I, th I think <clears throat> it is more or less mathematically equivalent. I mean, we're talking about the maximal violation as well here, right? So you're hitting Cyrilson's bound and there's no kind of error here as well. So it's kind of, yeah, things get simplified. So yeah, okay, and then... Um, in 2017, all bipartite entangled pure states can be self-tested, as was shown. And as Remick knows well, certain families of multipartite states can also be self-tested um, through some nice general techniques of projecting into subspaces and things like this. Um, but as far as I know, it's still open if all multipartite um, states can be self-tested. Um, so there are general families that can be self-tested, but it's it's unknown in general. Okay, and this and the multipartite setting is interesting, right? You don't have the nice kind of Schmidt decomposition and things like this. Things become complicated when you have three or more parties. So you know when you can't solve a major open question, what you do is you generalize the question, <laughs> you generalize the setting, um, in the hope of uh, being able to solve an open problem there, or you know. Uh, you know, at least try and make some progress on open open problems. So what we've done is thought about this more general setting where you have um, N parties, but you're, you really want to know some information about the state on a subset of the parties. So given all N partite correlations of this form, can we conclude the quantum state shared by some or all of the parties? Okay, and so, we came up with this, this distinct notion called network self-testing, where we say that the n-partite correlations network self-test the particular m-partite state, where m can be less than n, if we can conclude that, again, up to some symmetries, this state is shared by m parties. So, you know, you, you can take some known self-testing results and kind of trivially expand them, right? You, you know, if you've got five parties and you've got a way of self-testing 
the tripartite GAZ states, you can always trivially add more parties, right? But uh, yeah, so we, we consider this more general notion and hopefully it'll become clear why we consider this more general notion. Okay. And, and the reason is because we have a result, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's nice to introduce definitions, but then it's also good to have results. Um, so for every finite dimensional pure m partite entangled states, there exists two m partite correlations that networks self-test. Um, a superposition of that state and its complex conjugate. Okay, so um, yes. So in some sense, we've resolved this open question about multipartite quantum states, if you allow this broader definition of network self-testing. Okay. And because networks are interesting um, and they get you funding, you can start throwing that word around and say, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so, uh, so, you know, the nice thing about networks is you have you? source. <laughs> um, so networks, have, uh, you could, the way you can think about them, you know, it's about connectivity and um, there's been, you know, a recent trend in looking at quantum networks where we can think about independent sources or having distinct causal constraints. So you may have some parties that have a particular source that has a quantum state and it goes to these parties and there may be an independent source over here, right, um, that gets distributed to other parties. So the, the, these networks are a nice playground where you can start thinking about independence constraints. So, you know, here I've got a, a network where I've got a quantum state gets distributed to all of the parties, but I can imagine two independent quantum states that is, get distributed to the parties as well. And so when you start imposing extra constraints on, on sources, it can actually reduce the symmetries under which we uh, self-test. And we have a result in this direction as well. So for every finite dimensional pure m partite entangled state, there exist m plus one partite correlations that network self-test that state or its complex conjugate, if you assume extra causal constraints. Um, so the or is different here. It's distinct from before where we had this superposition of the state and its complex conjugate. Now we, we say we, we have that state or you have the complex conjugate. Okay. Right, any questions at this point or shall I kind of outline the idea? So maybe I would ask uh, about, yeah. uh, so you said that, so how it was for every M partite uh, pure entangled state? Yeah. But does this state need to be like genuinely entangled or any entangled state or? Right, that's a good question. So but we're considering <laughs> pure states. So, um, you know, that simplifies things in terms of being genuine entangled. But yes, you would start with the genuinely entangled pure states. And then if it's not genuinely entangled, you would just run parallel self-tests. Okay, but your scheme includes that, no? I mean... It's... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So the point being that you can take the, the, the genuinely entangled part, run the process on that, and then also on the other genuinely entangled part. So you would reduce it down to it's genuinely... Um, okay, but if you don't know the state a priori, no, then you... How do you know which uh, which uh, subsystems? Uh... Ah, okay. If you if you don't know which where, how it's separable across, so I'm assuming that you you're given a description of the state and you want to certify that you have that particular state. So this is certification where you're promised that. Yeah, but then you, okay. the... But that means that you can like from the beginning assume that the state is genuinely entangled, no? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, right, yeah, so the idea outline is, is um, right, for, okay, yeah, as a disclaimer for simplicity, I'll mostly describe the work for bipartite systems, and I'll often refer specifically to qubits, um, um, or talk about embedding higher dimensional systems in enough qubits and things like this. Um, because the, the idea is naturally generalized to more parties and high dimensional systems. So hopefully we'll see that the more systems and high dimensions is a straightforward generalization. But to kind of give intuition of the idea, I'll, I'll probably just be very simple. I'll be very simple in talk, talking about bipartite systems, but also often refer to qubits. Okay. So, you know, ideally, 
you would have this setting that you have a system that produces a bipartite state and uh, the state production is IID. So you have an identical quantum state produced and it's independent from round to round. So you push a button, the state gets produced and it's IID. And in this uh, box here, you have characterized known measurements. So what you can do is you could just perform state tomography in the worst case, right? This, this state comes out and you can just uh, do uh, make tomographically complete measurements. And okay, nice property of quantum theory is that the measurements can be local. If this is a bipartite system, you can have local tomographically complete measurements. Okay. And I call this the characterized setting because the, the measurement devices are characterized and they're, they're known from round to round. So clearly this is, this is not device independent. So we have a little bit of work to do. Um, but what we'll do is we'll go from um, a setting in where measurements are completely characterized and trusted to ones where they are partially characterized. And so they can be treated as some sort of black box again. So ideally we would have them being completely uncharacterized, but we'll go to this intermediate setting here. Where what we'll do is instead of having these characterized measurements here that are chosen from a set indexed by Y, we'll have a, a fixed measurement here that is completely unknown and uncharacterized, but we can feed the measurement a quantum state. And we'll call this a quantum input in addition to part of a quantum state row AB. Okay, so you've got an index here of, um, yeah, you've, you've got a, a way of indexing your collection of quantum states, which will be fed into your measurement device along with uh, whatever this unknown um, source is. And you have some number of outcomes A. So we go from um, a setting where we have a known dimension of systems and with characterized measurements to having an unknown dimension of the systems, row AB. Uh, this is some uh, system that we do not have direct access to. Um, so it's more like the device independent case here. Um, we have these uncharacterized measurements. The measurements will take some known characterized quantum inputs. Okay. Um, sometimes this is called the, the measurement device independent setting. Um, so it's kind of an intermediate setting between device dependent and device independent. So, okay, if you knew that um, the measurements being made in this box were Bell state measurements and that the states were tomographically complete, these two settings are, are completely equivalent, right? So making these local tomographic measurements here is equivalent to making um, a Bell state measurement in addition to tomographically complete uh, states coming in. Um, okay. And the idea is, is it's similar to this measurement device independent UKD setting that we have these quantum inputs where but through the Bell effect get mapped into effects essentially. So it's the same idea that you have this nice kind of uh, duality between the effects and the states uh, up to a, a complex conjugation. Okay. So, right. So yes, so this setting, assuming that these are Bell state measurements, these two settings are completely equivalent. Of course, I'm a priori not assuming they're Bell state measurements, but trying to show that, you know, in this special case, you do get it being completely recovered. And that's, I think that's the intuition here. Okay. And another way of expanding the setting is um, by getting rid of this assumption of uh, the trusted quantum inputs and replacing it with a remote state preparation. Okay, so initially we just plugged in some known um, quantum states into these devices. Now, instead, what we could do is just do remote state preparation, prepare maximally entangled state, and then on one half of the maximally entangled state, we make a, a, a Pauli measurement, for example, for qubits, and then on the other end, we just plug that qubit into the other end. And that's, again, equivalent to um, the setting on the left. Okay. So the idea is that maximum integral states will be used as a resource for pre preparing quantum inputs on uh, remote parties. Okay. 
So now going to the device independent setting, we want to uh, get rid of this assumption here, right? That we're preparing maximally entangled states and making particular measurements on one half of the maximally entangled states. We want to be able to do this in a device independent black box way. So um, what we need to do is certify that we share these uh, entangled states and make these local measurements. So we start from our initial uncharacterized measurements. We add for each of these uncharacterized measurements an additional party and uh, then treat everything in the device independent fashion. Okay, so what we want to do is replace what goes on here with a black box, but then certify that they, the, the parties are actually making uh, um, in, entangled states with Pauli measurements. Okay, so to summarize what's going on, we, we, we have this long path of starting from this tomographic setting and by um, introducing additional resources, we will go to this uh, um, setting, which is the device independent setting. I, Remick, I think you. Yes, I, I have a question. So, why you need to uh, to have quantum inputs in those uh, measuring devices? What's the idea behind that? Um, well, the idea behind it is that um, in this particular setting, we will be able to um, conclude from statistics that you um, have a particular quantum state. So, you can certify any multipartite pure entangled state. In this setting, if you have these quantum inputs, because you have this particular case where if you do have the Bell state measurements, you're just basically performing tomography, right? Yes, but yeah, yeah. but then I guess you can certify every uh, quantum state. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't doesn't need to be pure or entangled. Ah, okay. It's a good question about uh, um, whether it can be mixed or pure. You can you can come up with an argument basically by if you start with a, a bipartite mixed state, um, you can purify it and then um, put the purification on one side. So now yes. that one okay. party has both the purification and now essentially two parties share a pure state, and then you can apply an isometry to to that purification and that thing on one side, so that everything is 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 essentially a pure state. And there's no way of distinguishing between a mixed state and a pure state in this case because um, mm -hmm. one. Okay, this is true. But then, do you need entanglement, like in raw AV? To well, I guess um, if, you, if you can perform uh, local quantum tomography, no, just like yeah. So, well, yeah. This is like this is it goes to like a general question of. Um, you know, okay, in traditional self-testing, you can kind of certify all pure or product states, right? I mean, trivially, there are isometries that take whatever you have. If, say, for example, that you have a trivial facet of the Bell polytope, mm -hmm. and then you, you, you get that value, you can, you can say, there exist isometries that take me to, to, uh, to a product state, for example. Mm -hmm. So we're only really interested in certifying and self-testing entangled states, but yeah, yeah, a, yeah. There's nothing really stopping you from trying to do tomography on, on several states, but the, the point being the entangled states will be the resource we care about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if the title of the paper was we can certify all product states that maybe people wouldn't be that interested. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, yes. uh, sorry. Can I ask? So just, yes. um, you know, people in quantum <laughs> information, quantum computing care only, not only about like sometimes they might care not only about features like you know non locality or entanglement, but also like purity or like this this kind of thing. So I understand that here, sort of everything is kind of up to okay. Is it what I don't get? Okay, so like because you do characterization, but it's, uh, you still have like freedom of like local uh, unitaries. Yeah, I, I was going to, yeah, exactly. I was going to get onto that a bit later. Yeah. But you, yeah, you have the freedom of applying local unitaries inside these devices. So, so, so yeah. So, so for example, is, is what is an allow Characterization up to freedom of local unitaries then? Yeah. 
that's the idea. So then, so you could imagine purity, like, well, I'll just discard whatever system I share with Alice and mm-hmm. create um, a pure state freely with up to arbitrary unitaries, right? Um, I'm allowed this. It's not, it's if you want to think of it a resource theoretic way, yeah. Like things that create pure states are part of my set of free resources. Sure, sure, sure. But like, imagine you do this kind of test in like, Harder or something, or oh, like I don't know, maybe it's a bit crazy. Like, to I mean, maybe no, that, okay, no, <laughs> no it's, it's, it's a nice question because, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, because you're granting a lot of power to these devices, for example, right? That they they can perform arbitrary unitaries, right? And you know, um, arbitrary unitaries is a hard thing to do practically so I, I i see your point that it's kind of maybe you actually want to restrict to set to free operations that are more no, no, experimentally I, I, I guess my point was that you know in, in general in tomography even if you don't you're not in the bell setting when you don't yeah. have like space time separation between devices yeah uh you know you, you do get i mean maybe certifying states is not so uh interesting but okay what i want to say is uh mm, Sorry, uh, and still you have like this, like in the standard tomography, you have this like uh, logical regression because you need to trust your measurements to, to, uh, right. to do tomography of a state, uh, right? And to do tomography yeah. of measurements, you need to certify have the state. trusted so, states, exactly. There's a, there's and a in standard uh, tomography, like it's a problem, like for characterizing qu- like quantum computers. <laughs> Yeah, right? yeah, uh, true. And people have like some ways out, like gate set tomography and stuff like this. So mm-hmm. maybe in this, okay. So that's okay. But this is like may, maybe I ask some more something more of in the like the discussion part. Sorry, Mark. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Right, yeah, yeah. I think I got to here, didn't I? Yeah. So, yeah, the idea is is we're going from this tomographic setting um, to this this setting with a, a larger number of parties. So we can go from something where, yeah, you do have this, you know, uh, trusted measurements, but I want to get rid of the trust, and so um, I'm going to replace things with black boxes. Um, and and so when I mentioned earlier about adding these extra causal constraints, so here I had, you know, I came along and I added in some extra resources, which are these maximally entangled states, because they're so, so, so easy to make. I should just, I throw them all around the place. Um, there are no experimentalists on this call, right? Okay, good. Um, so um, now I can imagine these sources, these maximally entangled states, I could imagine them coming from somewhere completely different and I'm plugging them into a network and the source of entanglement uh, here is independent of the source of, in- of entanglement here, and it's also independent from this source. So I can start adding in extra constraints. Instead of them coming from a single source, they come from uh, independent sources. And that allows me some extra wiggle room where I can say things, uh, I can say some more things about uh, self testing. So for one thing, I can start grouping together all of these additional systems into a single party, whereas before I had them to being you know, extra space-like separated parties from the other ones, these other black boxes. Now I can just group them all together and uh, that allows me to also uh, do some self-testing. Okay. And um, what what I quite like about th- this approach that's quite nice um, is that it's, it's agnostic about the initial uh, state being certified. Um, so, it, you know, it's a general recipe for a given state, you start with a given state, you can uh, reduce it to this device independent setting. And it doesn't really care what this kind of initial state is, um, up to some fundamental properties. Um, and, and it can be generalized naturally to arbitrary number of parties and arbitrary uh, uh, local uh, dimension. So a lot of really nice um, work on self-testing multipartite states, you know, it utilizes certain properties of graph states and um, other kinds of states where they have nice properties on projections into subspaces and things like this. And um, what I quite like about this approach is that it kind of uh, circumvents a lot of that. Um, uh, but as a result, maybe of 
practicality, but at least it's conceptually interesting. Okay, so in the remainder of my time, um, I'll try and go into a bit more detail about each of these uh, parts. But does anyone have any uh, questions of, like on the overall picture? Did that make intuitive sense? Um, to me, yes. Okay, good. So I, I have a general question. Uh, yeah. Like about this self-testing. Uh, yeah. So I understand that uh, if you want to self-test something, then you need to specify what this something is. Uh, yeah. And like in those scenarios, uh, like, okay, in general, so do, uh, do you, uh, can you consider so some cases where it, there is no efficient description of uh, your state or something like this, or like, uh, you know, it's a very general question uh, without any yeah. specific in, uh, thing in mind. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a good question that, um, yeah, so, you know, if you want to translate it to something like computer science, you, you know, you start with yeah. your input, which is your, your quantum state, and I, exactly. I, I want to certify that quantum state. I mean, how do I give that quantum state to someone? Is it, is it as a, a vector which has a general inefficient description in the number of the systems, or is yeah, it in yeah, terms yeah. of a quantum state? Um, yeah, we, it's, it's a really good question. Um, so um, I think if, you, if it were given to you in terms of a circuit description, you could start using tricks like that and actually make some of these protocols more efficient. But I'm assuming it's just kind of given to you as a classical description. So it's an, you know, it's an exponentially long vector or something like that. That's what I'm asking. Okay, the, so but I'm like asking. in practice, if you would like to do this, then it would need, it would have to be like an efficient classical description. Uh, um, yeah, I mean that that you know for for certain purposes, but um, yeah, um, yeah. So this work doesn't really touch upon that. It's more just a general set of recipes for how you do self testing. But then that's an excellent question that would be on top of this. Yeah, like, sure, sure. No, I understand. No, yeah, I mean I'm, yeah. it's not like uh, yeah. No, I, but I, I think it's a really interesting question of like for most like uh, quantum computing applications, you would want an efficient description. And mm -hmm. maybe that efficient description is something you could leverage um, to actually have a more efficient protocol. Sure. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So um, I'll talk about this intermediate setting where we introduce these partially characterized uh, measurements that also have a quantum input. Okay. And this was uh, based on some work with Ivan Shrupic, Lai Domingo Colomer, and uh, Antonio Thien. Um, okay. So yes, to go in a little bit more detail about this setting, we have uh, th this P uh, row AB, um, the dimensions of the systems is unknown, and uh, we have these uncharacterized measurements, and the measurements take quantum inputs, and these are characterized. So, you know, um, we imagine that there's an Hilbert, Hilbert space uh, HA and HB, and rho is um, acting on those Hilbert spaces. And, these boxes here correspond to uh, measurements. So here we have a joint measurement M, which acts on the system A prime, which is this system, and also A. And we have uh, another POVM element that uh, acts on B and B prime. And this B prime is where you have your trusted quantum inputs, and also with A prime here. So what happens is you assume that you've got, again, IID states and measurements. So each time you run the experiment, your, um, your measurements and states aren't, aren't varying, but you um, have local measurements performed on um, parts of the shared state as well as the quantum input state. So then the, again, as I said, the statistics look like this. So we've got P, A, B. So A, B are just the classical measurement outcomes of uh, these general measurements. And then we've got um, the input states, um, psi X, uh, psi Y. Okay. So conditioned on these particular inputs, I get uh, A and B in the statistics. Okay, so, and some nice simplifications is the dimensions are unbounded. So for convenience, I can make the measurements, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the dimensions are unbounded. So for convenience, I can make the measurements projective. And also I can purify the state as well. So I can, because I'm, I have unbounded dimension, I can start introducing uh, 
um, auxiliary systems, which is quite useful, mostly for doing calculations, um, but without loss of generality. So now, given these statistics, P, A, B, given Psi, X, Psi, Y, we want to be able to certify that a particular state, rho A, B, is shared by um, the two systems here. Okay, so what problems do we have? And, and this came up in, in the discussion with Michal that we, we have, because we have an unknown dimension, you could imagine auxiliary systems are introduced and your measurements act kind of trivially on these auxiliary systems, uh, perhaps non-trivially. We also, because the measurements are un, uncharacterized, you could imagine applying unitaries to both the states and measurements. Um, so, you know, for example, here I've got U, a unitary U being applied to the joint state, and then it's kind of that unitary is undone at the measurements. And this doesn't affect the statistics. But what it does affect is our claims about the state, right? Because we're saying we want to certify that a particular state was generated. But if we're freely allowed to unitarily um, change the state, then it makes it very difficult to make these claims. Okay. So the point being here is that we can only certify quantum state up to local isometries. So the introduction of auxiliary systems and unitaries applied to um, these systems and uh, the auxiliary systems. Okay. So any claim that you make about what the state is will always have to hold up to local isometries. So in some sense, these local isometries are free operations that you're um, allowing yourself because they don't change the statistics. Okay, so a convenient thing to do, um, if in the case that your quantum inputs here are tomographically complete for a particular uh, uh, dimension, for a particular Hilbert space, if the tomography is complete, you can do measurement tomography, essentially. You can define an effective measurement on the quantum inputs. And this is just, you know, the expression we had before, but we're, we've taken out the particular quantum states here. So you're, you're kind of grouping all of um, all of this together and treating it as a as a as a, a POVM in and of itself. And so we have these M tilde ABs, these uh, effective measurements that act on the, the quantum inputs. Okay, so why these effective measurements are useful as well if, if we think about um, teleportation if the measurements here inside the devices are bell state measurements then what you'll do is essentially up to a transpose is teleport the state here into the um, additional space from so from a to a prime you'll basically teleport um, Row A B, that's the intuition, right? So if you're um, basically teleporting row A B into these additional auxiliary registers, uh, A prime and B prime, then the effective measurement will essentially be proportional to this joint state again after this uh, transpose. Okay. So this effective measurement is a bit like is a bit analogous to um, the correlations or the Bell inequality value in device independent quantum information. So because we know we have these trusted quantum inputs, we've got Hilbert spaces lying around, we can define these positive operators and these will the thing, uh, be the things that give us um, our certificate for certification. Okay, and so here's a very lengthy theorem. So if we have two parties, Alice and Bob, they share state row AB and they have access to a tomographically complete set of inputs, psi x, psi y. If each party performs a joint measurement on their state row AB and a quantum input, and if these correlations written in terms of this effective measurement are this form here, and we find that when we do um, run this experiment a bunch of times, and we find that this effective measurement is proportional to a, psi, um, to a state psi, we can self-test this state psi up to some uh, correcting unitaries. Okay, so the idea is um, it, 
okay, we said that if you have um, Bell state measurements, then you can teleport the state. And then the idea is, well, um, if I'm given that my effective measurements have this particular form that they're proportional to the state, I can kind of infer backwards that I've got something like a Bell state measurement. So this, um, this was kind of the main theory. And this generalizes to um, um, many parties. Okay. Ati, can I have a question? Yeah. 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 Uh, this isometry that uh, is in the question three. Yeah. So, so you, you you know it's explicit explicit form, no? It's uh, I mean you can cons you yep. construct. Okay. It's a it's a constructive um, proof. So I was going to quickly show the isometry. Why it's um, called theoretical construction? I mean, it's ah. So sometimes this comes up that people think that this. You say that there exists an isometry that takes whatever is inside your box and turns it into the thing that you're certifying, people think that's actually done, uh, implemented in the protocol. But the point of this isometry is it's a mathematical tool saying it, that there exists an isometry that will take whatever you have to um, that state that you care about. So it's a theoretical construction, okay? <laughs> that's what I mean by that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, no one's actually implementing this isometry in, in the laboratory, necessarily. Okay, and, and this, this isometry is essentially a form of teleportation. Um, so you have this register, which is your trusted quantum input. Um, and then this is the measurement that acts uh, on the unknown state. And what you do here is you essentially create a, uh, the maximally entangled state. Uh, make a bell state measurement in the ideal case, and then have to do a local correction here. So, you know, in the case where if this were teleportation, you would come in here, you then teleport the state to the other side. And so whatever state you have here, assuming this is a bell state measurement, gets teleported over here up to this local correction. So this quantum Fourier transform, you know, in the simple case of teleportation is the Hadamard. Uh, this local correction is one of the Paulis, depending on the measurement outcome you get here. And this is a higher dimensional generalization of um, the, the not operator, it's just the shift operator. And this is, in the case of qubits, the control knot. Okay, so the idea is whatever unknown system you have here, you can construct this isometry that will take it and uh, plug it over there. So if the measurements are generalized Bell state measurements, then this will just teleport the certified state into the A double prime, B double prime registers. Okay. Um, and, that, and that's the isometry. It's kind of, yeah, it's quite straightforward, hopefully. Um, right. So this was the first step. Given statistics, we can infer the state up to local isometries. Now we want to replace these quantum inputs with uh, black boxes. Okay, so how much time? Oh, okay, I'm not doing great on time. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to be as good as I can be. Okay, so the second step now is we want to start from this black box setting uh, in the bottom right and be able to recover given certification that you have a joint state with local measurements. Okay. So this is now a traditional Bell test, which hopefully uh, uh, you're familiar with, uh, where we're assuming you've got an IID state of measurement, again, unbounded measurement uh, dimensions. So we can assume uh, measurements are projective and the state space is pure. And then we're just gonna collect kind of a Bell test statistics, which look like this. Okay. Um, and in terms of obstacles to making uh, certification claims, well, we inherit the ones that we had before, which are that um, local isometries leave statistics inv invariant, so that any claim you have would have to be up to local isometries. But there's a new problem that emerges that we didn't have before in the, the previous setting, which is that of complex conjugation. So if you take your state and you complex conjugate it, um, and you do that to all of the measurements as well, this leaves the statistics invariant. So if all, you, if all you're given are the statistics, you won't be able to distinguish between the complex conjugation applied to everything uh, and, or, or just the original state of measurements. 
Okay. And, and complex conjugation, um, despite some interesting papers that claim the opposite, um, is an unphysical operation. So there is no isometry that performs this task of taking the state to its complex conjugate. And um, if our techniques are really based on uh, having tomographically complete states, we're going to run into a problem of, of um, having complex numbers around. Um, there may be tricks and techniques to get around ha having issues of complex conjugation in simple cases, but because we want to infer that our devices are producing um, tomographically complete states, we, we will have to confront this issue. Okay, now there are two options for dealing with this complex conjugation that you can't distinguish between the state and its complex conjugate. You can live with it, and certain people are discussing, um, suggest this, that okay, these are just two things that you um, cannot interchange, that they have to be self-tested separately. And it does, it, because there aren't physical operations between these two different things, then um, you just got to live with it. Um, or you can you, you can fudge the setting a little bit. Um, so you can generalize things a little bit. So this is what we opt for. So what we're going to do is allow for the possibility that you can have superpositions of your state and uh, the complex conjugate. So something that looks like here, uh, this at the bottom here. So we're going to allow for the possibility that you can self-test um, the state or its complex conjugate but you uh, keep track of whether it's the state or its conjugate um, using additional auxiliary qubits. So um, this information gets sent out to each uh, measurement site and it helps you keep, um, systems keep track of whether it's um, the original state or the complex conjugate. So given the state of this form, then we just can use, we can make local measurements of this form, right? So these are just projectors that um, will act on psi, if we have zero and um, this um, this is um, pi uh, stars as the complex conjugate if we have one. So each of these is a local measurement and depending on the value of whether you have zero or one, it will act accordingly. Again, uh, this sorry, will- Matthew, just a, yeah. a question. Why do you like call it superposition? Because like you'll get, wait, maybe I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. like, aren't you getting like the same statistics if you just have a classical mixture? Yeah, yeah, you could you could use a classical mixture as well. You could mix these things. Um, um, what you can imagine we're doing here is giving the kind of the most it's the most adversarial setting that you're allowing a purification. So which is kind of a more a generalization of the of the statistical mixture. So you can allow the devices to have a purification. Yeah, but you could indeed have a statistical mixture as well. Yeah. Um, I see, I see. Okay, so like in a sense, like whatever you do, will sort of you, you can like certify like a family of states because you can have a bit of this. Uh, yes. This, yeah. 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 It's like a single parameter family, if you will. Yeah. Okay. So the way to think about these zeros and ones is that they're just uh, a common reference fra frame. Um, so it just indicates the kind of handedness um, of the particular reference frame. And that, that information is communicated to each of the sites. Okay, and it leaves the statistics invariant. I think it was Matthew McCaig that first came up with this proposal for generalizing self-testing to allow for, the, for these um, superpositions of states and complex conjugates. Okay, so, um, right. So what we're going to do is self-test pairs of maximally entangled states and then perform Pauli measurements on half of the qubit pairs. And this is sufficient to prepare the Pauli eigenstates for the other party, as I said earlier. Okay. And what we're going to do is uh, go into the literature. Okay. It's, it's no coincidence that the two of the, yeah, three of the authors on this paper also, three of the authors on this paper I'm talking about. So, uh, um, so what they have in this paper is a way of self-testing the maximally entangled states and also Pauli measurements on maximally entangled states if you're given maximal violation of uh, a set of CHSH inequalities. And so uh, what they can show is um, 
If you get the maximal violation, there exists an isometry that maps the experimental state to Pauli measurements on halves of n maximally entangled states. So in this case, you know, this psi would be uh, pairs of maximally in, in, entangled two qubit states. And then these would just be the, the Pauli uh, projectors. Okay. And, and the reason why we have uh, the, the, this handedness, this, this extra qubit of information, this is to keep track of the complex conjugate because uh, we need to keep track of whether we're going to measure Pauli y or, or minus y. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So if if we got the so yeah for the so they they go through this for qubits, but it generalizes to multi-qubit states. So if you get the maximal violation of a sum of three CHSH expressions, you um, uh, you can show that there exists an isometry that maps it to uh, this state with measurements. And in this experiment one party which in our case will be the auxiliary party, measures Pauli X, Y, and Z. And the other party makes uh, one of six measurements, which are basically like uh, rotated measurements in the block sphere. So it's like X plus Y, Y plus Z, and, and so on. So things that are not uh, Paulis. Okay. And then the isometry looks like this. This is um, called the swap isometry. So if, if you're familiar with self-testing, you might see have seen something like this. What this does, why it's called the swap isometry is because it, um, it swaps the state stored here and here into these uh, auxiliary registers here. Okay. Um, yeah, right. So the point being that up to local isometries, given the maximal violation of a particular band inequality, one partly uh, remotely prepares Pauli eigenstates up to this issue of complex conjugation. So you're having to keep track of whether you have this system or it's, it's complex conjugate superposition. So in the time I've got left, I'll put this all together with lovely pictures. Um, so we started in this setting here. We um, have this self-testing here and here, which allows us to deduce that the, the two parties share maximally entangled state. They make Pauli measurements. And so then um, we can certify given statistics between um, these two states and, and sorry, these two parties and these two parties that you're preparing the Pauli eigenstate or possibly it's complex conjugate and you have to keep track of that. So now um, you, once you're in the setting that you know that you're preparing up to isometries, the Pauli eigenstate or its complex conjugate, you can then use um, the result I uh, mentioned earlier to get back to um, this fully characterized um, setting. So the idea being that I can compose these isometries and deduce that I'm sharing a particular quantum state, even though I started in this fully device independent setting. But I had as my kind of subroutine, this self-testing of the maximally entangled state. Okay, so here's a lot of words. Um, so the first result is for qubits, there are N main parties and for each party, there's an auxiliary party. If the n main parties each make one of seven measurements, six for the self-testing of the maximum entangled states and one for the trusted quantum input certification, which is a bell state measurement. So each main party makes one of seven measurements and then each associated auxiliary party makes one of three measurements, which just corresponds to the, the Pauli measurements. If you get that maximal violation of the CHS, this, these CHSH expressions, then the resulting effective measurement is proportional and, sorry, and the resulting effective measurement is proportional to the target state. Then there exists CPTP maps that up to some extra junk that we don't care about, maps our initial physical state to the superposition of psi and psi star. Okay. And uh, in the case where we have these independent sources. Okay, can we, I do a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so can you go back to the to the other slide? Yeah. So you say that uh, so one for the trusted quantum input certification bell state measurement, but you have to do you have to certify this measurement or? 
no, you don't have to certify this measurement, no. So you, you, um, you look at the statistics PAB given psi x, psi y, so you're conditioned on knowing that you've got the particular Pauli eigenstates being plugged in, mm -hmm. and all you do is just look at the statistics PAB given psi x, psi y. So you don't have to certify that you have the Bell state measurement. Pretty sure if you wanted to, you could, um, but it's, it's more than that's more than we need. Okay. And um, yeah, so what changes here now is we can take all of these additional N parties, put, put them into one auxiliary party. And um, um, now we can uh, self-test this state or this state. So either that, that everything is um, um, psi or psi star. And the intuition behind this is, well, if the sources are independent, they, they're not allowed to have this shared reference frame where either they have uh, psi or psi star, right? That, that they don't have these zero, 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 one, 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 because each of the um, states that they prepare is independent. And that's, that's the intuition there. So you get rid of this shared reference frame. Okay. Okay, so I should, I should really stop talking now. Um, so yeah, so the, the idea here was that the network approach allows one to compose smaller elements using uh, primitives to certify quantum states. And what, what's quite nice that came out of this was consideration of these, these causal constraints. Um, good. So to do, right. Um, this was very much uh, like, you know, uh, an existential proof somehow, you know, wh whether it's practical or not, uh, you know, I'll leave up to you. Um, there are many things that one would like to do to make this into a, a nice quantum information protocol, I think, is to, to have robustness. So you would want to allow for experimental imperfections in um, the statistics so that you could say, oh, to some small error, I actually can certify this state. Because currently we need these, our effective measurements to be exactly proportional to the states we care about, and we need maximal violation of these Bell inequalities. It's all IID, so if you care about memory effects and being non-IID and finite statistics and these things, you would have to generalize it there. Some of the tools are inefficient, but you know, it's a worst case analysis, so you're doing state tomography at the heart of it. You could use some clever quantum state certification and lift some of these protocols instead. Um, one thing that what delayed us kind of putting this paper out was trying to reduce the number of parties from two end to end. So we had some ideas, but there was always like a little wrinkle preventing that. And like, we, we already had the results of using two end parties to self-test this end, this end partite state for a while. And then we were like, okay, let's try and, you know, reduce the number of parties. Let's make it more like traditional self-testing. And um, yeah, I can, I can talk about that, but um, yeah. And another thing that I find quite interesting is, is more foundational questions um, where you, you want to look at the landscape of physical theories and use self-testing as a way of singling out quantum theory. So the fact that our approach is using teleportation and Bell state measurements and like these, this, you know, um, elaborate dynamics, which is something that more general theories don't have, it would be quite nice if you could you could isolate what theories um, enable self-testing all states using something analogous to our approach. Yeah, and, and this is just a recent thing I thought about inspired by this, this paper by Miriam Violin and Roger Kolbeck, and uh, I should definitely stop talking. So thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay, thanks, Matty, for, for this nice presentation. So do you people have any questions? What do you mean, you people? Well, the other people attending the seminar. <laughs> Sorry, it was it's a little meme. <laughs> well, I didn't ask you. <laughs> oh, I think so, a hand appeared from somewhere. Actually, I have two questions, but one is boring. So, um, my first question is like, um, it's basically about this first point in your conclusion slide. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible to? Um, like generalized the setting where you have some errors and some some non-robust uh, machines with the like technology you have mathematically, or do you, is it like a big leap to get to this? Um, so it, I think we initially thought it was possible, um, but like the, the errors would be 
tiny essentially that it could tolerate a non-zero amount of error but yeah, you know no. yeah non-zero it leaves a lot of wiggle room yeah. <laughs> so um <laughs> So you might say, okay, that you, you, you have your epsilon close to a violation and then <clears throat> like, and then you're some power of epsilon away in the fidelity at the end or something of the, your target state. Yeah. Um, but now I'm trying to remember what, it was a while ago that what problems we had. I think it was with the issue of the bell state measurement. Mm -hmm. So you might have to go in and do like robust self-testing of the bell state measurement itself, which again may add to your woes in terms of proving robustness. So I think with the current machinery we have analytically, you might be able to get some non-zero tolerance, but it would be, I reckon, quite small. Yeah. So for a definition of practical, probably not practical. Yeah. Um, my other query, a question was, um, I mean, I haven't read your paper. I probably should do. I guess it's in there, but. Um, you said a few times that you you assume uh, unbounded dimension, right? In your, yeah. Uh, is that unbounded but finite, or does it still work if your machine is to infinite dimensional systems? Um, excellent question. I'm assuming unbounded but finite. Yeah. 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 So it can choose um, uh, if it has influence, or. Um, so for certain self-tests i think infinite dimensional systems gives you no extra fava voom but yeah that that doesn't hold in general okay. um from off the top of my head so yeah you would have to you would have to prove some kind of approximability and given that this isn't robust like yeah, yeah. yeah you, you would have to prove that you would yeah you, you could be epsilon close with a high enough dimension, yeah. but yeah, so unbounded, but for now. Okay, any other question? Let me can I? Yes, of course. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, uh, uh, you raised your hand or something? Because I don't hi, hi, hi. I also had a question. Oh, hi, yeah. hi, Shubhain. yeah, hi, hi, thanks for the talk. So I wanted to ask that, uh, as you said, that you need a tomogra tomographically complete set of states mm -hmm. to, to uh, self-test like a, any multipartite rectangle state. So mm -hmm. as you showed that for d equal to 2, there is like some works which show this show, show this uh, self-testing. But what about like higher dimensions? Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a, yeah, again, this is a bit of trickery that you can say, um, whatever dimensional system you have your target dimension you can encode it in enough qubits is essentially that's like that's one way to generalize it so um you know if, if you have a three-dimensional system you could encode it in two qubits right as, as in a subspace in two two qubits so the, the point being that your tomographic complete set of states grows much faster than the dimension of the system so that's another source of inefficiency. But yes, that is one approach to generalize it to uh, high dimensional systems. But like, would I advocate that as the most efficient? No, but it's, again, it's just, you, we're just showing that something is possible rather than practical. Uh, I see, so, so like uh, if you have considered like for D equal to three, you need to like look at tomographically complete set of measure like uh, states in like d equal to four right yeah exactly something yeah like this. Oh. yeah oh. so it's Thanks. you know it's a lot <laughs> Michal, you want to talk yeah one uh, one quick question so do you are you able to also self-test uh, measurements performed um um Maybe. <laughs> this is actually something I've not thought about. Um, I'm not seeing a reason why not, um, but it's, I've not, not worked through it, essentially. Like, I, 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 like you're, you're composing isometries, which, okay. I mean, the, the, yeah, there may be some trick, there may be some issues with the bell state measurement, just kind of it being compatible, but yeah, yeah. And one more question. So I just want to clarify if I understood you right. So 
at some I mean, uh, as you said, the heart of your protocol is essentially state topography uh, of two parties, so or, or many parties. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you made a comment that perhaps we can just uh, use, uh, okay, if we are interested in, in some specific state, I guess what you're implying, we can just do, I know, fidelity witness or something like this. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So, you could, like do, you could do something like that. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, or indeed, you know, yeah. So, for example, if it's a maximum entangled state, you just need to make x, x, and z, z measurements, right? Sure, you never, sure, even, sure. No, you never right, even have sure. to touch y, for example, and yeah. Right, but that would be like a certification up to local isometries again. Right? Again, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But cool. but you're you're looking at a subset of the of the of the data, so yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, that's like what people do in tomo I mean. Exactly. That's why people don't do tomography for larger systems. They do. Indeed, indeed. That's why, yeah, tomography is complete overkill for certification. That's why you have efficient certification schemes, but in tomography in general, isn't you know, it's not efficient, right? Yeah. So the, again, this is a kind of a worst case approach, and um, it would be nice to actually take some of the results on certification and like I think like Ryan O'Donnell and various people have been working on and and uh, like see how that changes things. But they look, I guess, at sample efficiency and things like this. Yeah. But that'd be nice. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so any other question? So maybe I would have one. So concerning this, uh, so you had this result with uh, with Ivan and Laya. Yeah. Where you use quantum inputs. So how yeah. this, for certification now, so how this compares to, to the paper by Kola Dangalo? I mean, so I mean, it's, it's known that you can like self-test any pure entangled state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But classical inputs, no? So why you need quantum inputs? Um, yeah, I mean, well, you know, the, um, so when we, we, we looked at this, it was before, um, it was kind of before this Cola D'Angelo paper came out. I mean, the paper was published 2020, but we kind of, it was a, it was a, um, like a summer project for Lyra, I think. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, it was a nice project to work on. And then um, you, you'll write that you, yeah, the Cola D'Angelo paper kind of came along and shows you how you could do it with classical inputs. Um, and so we um, tried to posit it that maybe it could be, um, useful in, in general kind of quantum network settings where you would use a hybrid of device independence and, and intermediate settings. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Cola D'Angelo et al result is, is more impressive and I would never say otherwise, but it's quite nice that this, per, this paper got repurposed as uh, something in this network self testing approach. Yeah. So, and in fact, in, I remember writing up, when we were writing up the paper, I even added a sentence saying, it would be quite nice to replace these quantum inputs with uh, like a device independent protocol. And so, yeah, and that, that's kind of what we did, yeah. But, the, but then, uh, okay, but the, then the, the number of like inputs grows with the, number of, uh, with the dimension, of, with the local dimension of the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and also the point, you know, the Cola D'Angelo is for bipartite, whereas this generalized the multipartite okay, okay. is, is, is always, I, yeah, I should have said that as well. I was kind of taking a historical okay. angle, but, but it generalizes for the multipartite case. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that's the more obvious answer. I don't know why I went on a little historical rant. So any other question? Okay, so it's, it seems that it's a uh, perfect time to, to, to finish this, uh, this seminar. Thank you, Matty, once more. Thanks for having me. See you, everyone. Thank you, Matty. Cheers. See you. See you. Bye.